Welcome to a new edition of System Update. I'm Glenn Greenwald. This episode focuses on the savage, brutal, and murderous history of the Central Intelligence Agency in the post-World War II era. The violent military coups, the destabilization programs, the imposition of murderous dictatorships and disinformation campaigns, all with an eye not only toward understanding the recent history of the United States, an important end unto itself, but also for understanding the kind of political order and the kind of society we now currently have, as well as to draw lessons from that recent history to understand our options for the future. Joining me to explore this topic is a journalist who has developed more expertise and specialization on this topic than almost anyone. He has worked for six years covering Brazil for the Los Angeles Times, and after that covered Indonesia for the Washington Post, two countries central to this narrative. And he's out with a new book just released, a very compelling, provocative, and truly eye-opening book called The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade and the Mass Murder Program that shaped our world, Vincent Bevins. And the reason I think this book is so worth reading and so worth discussing is because it does really shed critical light on, as I said, not just historical truths, but current truths that are shaped by that recent history. It's really almost impossible to understand current political debates and questions in a sophisticated or even an accurate way without having a meaningful grasp on that history. And not only don't most of us have a meaningful grasp on that history without making a diligent effort to obtain it, quite the contrary, we are fed propaganda and mythologies very systematically and deliberately in order to obfuscate that history and to mislead and deceive us about what that history really Entailed, And so the only way to liberate yourself from those propagandistic prisms is to do things like talk to people like Vincent Bevins, read books like the one that he has just written, which I just finished this week um, and am still grappling with and thinking a lot about. Now, one of the reasons that I believe that this kind of a history is so vital is because I had this kind of realization, an epiphany, over the last four years about how Americans grapple with their own political history. During the course of the debates that were uh, created and, and fostered by Russiagate, I, in 2016 and 2017, began liberal, hearing liberals frequently reading from what to me seemed like a very dreary and familiar and discredited Cold War script that for decades the far right had used to demonize and malign American liberals. And I was really mystified at how American liberals could pick up that same script and start wielding it seamlessly against their own political adversaries. Claims that people are Kremlin agents, that they're useful idiots. Even that phrase was a far-right phrase pioneered by the National Review and J. Edgar Hoover to understand how the Kremlin was infiltrating American institutions. And it actually started baffling me that there was no effort made on the part of American liberals to reconcile the ugly history that had been deployed against them of this Cold War script, this McCarthyite mentality, with their current rhetoric and current tactics to use against their adversaries. And at some point, what I realized is that they weren't doing it because they were aware that they were using the script that had been deployed against them and thinking that it would be some kind of Machiavellian or clever or shrewd reversal of tactics to start wielding it against their political adversaries. There was just simply an ignorance, a benign ignorance about what McCarthyism even was, about what the nature of Cold War debates was. And I think a lot of times when we have our own personal knowledge about particular historical events, we just assume that that historical knowledge is commonplace. And one of the things I realized is that there are a lot of people paying attention to politics for the first time, either because of fears over Donald Trump's election in 2016, or perhaps going back a little bit earlier to the financial crisis of 2008, and even the election of Barack Obama, which inspired people to get involved for politics for the first time, that unless you make the effort to really go and dig through historical truths, it's easy to be blinded either by benign ignorance or through propaganda. And I don't speak 
about that from a mountaintop, but through my own personal experience, having began writing about politics for the first time and therefore focusing on it as kind of a full-time vocation and then ultimately a career in 2005, there were all kinds of assumptions that I had ingested about U.S. history and U.S. politics from not paying very close attention, from just reading the New York Times or reading the New Yorker each week or the New York Times in the morning and just uncritically ingested what I was being told and, and not having the time or the energy or, or, or the, the impetus to really critically examine it. There were all kinds of things I ended up believing about U.S. history, recent and distant, that were simply untrue that I didn't really fully come to appreciate until I sat down and made the effort to dig deep and erase all the assumptions that I had and start from scratch and try and construct what I really understood history to be. So one of the reasons I think this book is so of such great public service and so worth highlighting and discussing is simply because I don't think this history is as known to many, many people as those of us who have been steeped in it for a while often assume is the case. A very similar mentality is evident in the way that Democrats and liberals have been speaking about claims of Russian interference in the 2016 election in increasingly histrionic terms. Early on in 2016, in late 2016 and 2017, various senators like the Republican from Arizona, John McCain, and the Democrat from New Hampshire, Janine Shaheen, insisted that what the Russians did was, quote, an act of war. And Senator Shaheen even introduced legislation demanding that it be treated as such by the U.S. government. And imagine viewing... Facebook ads and Twitter bots and the release of emails as an act of war against a nuclear armed power, the country with the second largest nuclear stockpile in the world. And then the rhetoric surrounding the 2016 election became to be even more unhinged as the years went by. Hillary Clinton, while on her book tour about her promoting her book about why she lost the 2016 election in her view, characterized Russian interference in the 2016 election as, in her words, a, quote, cyber 9-11. The New York Times foreign affairs columnist Thomas Friedman began comparing it not only to 9-11, but also to Pearl Harbor. And all of that culminated when two prominent Democratic politicians, a member of Congress, Gerald Nadler, and a longtime Clinton operative, Felipe Reigns, both went on to Chris Hayes' show and insisted that Russian interference in the 2016 election was, quote, the equivalent of Pearl Harbor. Well, my reaction to the news is that this is absolute proof of what we knew all along and what the president has denied, namely that we were attacked. Uh, this was a very serious attack against the United States by a hostile foreign power, an attack against uh, our election process, our, our entire governing process. Um, that it, 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 we know that the attack is continuing and that uh, our intelligence agencies tell us that uh, it's going to certainly continue through the next election and the president and the Republicans in the House, for that matter, refuse refuse to do anything about uh, protecting us from an attack. Imagine if FDR uh, had denied that the Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor and, and didn't react. That's the equivalent. Well, it's a bit of a different thing. I mean, no, it's not. They didn't kill anyone. They didn't kill anyone, but they're destroying our demo our, our country. Do you really think it's on, you think it's on par? Not in the amount of violence, but I think in the in the seriousness. It is very much on par. We, this country exists to have a democratic system with a small d. That's what the country's all about. And this is an attempt to destroy that. And the president's core, uh, the presidential oath is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And this president is refusing to do that. Now, imagine the level of historical ignorance and attachment to the most maximalist versions of American exceptional, uh, exceptionalism needed to believe that this ordinary, relatively trivial interference by the Russians in 2016 in the form of Facebook ads and Twitter bots and the release of emails, if you believe every claim about the Russians and what they did in 2016, the level of ignorance and American exceptionalism and jingoism needed to believe that that's some kind of unprecedented, never-before-seen, out-of-the-ordinary crime when you set it next to the far more extreme and severe acts of murder and torture and destabilization and coups and subversion of democracy and imposition of dictatorships that the CIA has engaged in in dozens of countries around the world since the end of World War II. Imagine being a citizen of any of these countries that the CIA has used murder and torture 
and violence, to subvert your elected governments and impose tyranny on your populations for years, if not outright wars. Being a citizen of Indonesia or Brazil or Chile or Guatemala or El Salvador or Nicaragua, the list goes on and on and on. And listening to American liberals talk about Facebook ads and Twitter bots and the release of some emails that were authentic as being this unprecedented crime, the greatest political crime of the last several decades, equivalent to Pearl Harbor and 9-11. And what makes it even more egregious, this rhetoric, is that these acts of the CIA in interfering in other countries, not with Twitter bots and, 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 and Facebook ads, but with violence and murder and mass detentions and torture, and dictatorships and coups, is that those events are not part of the distant past. They're part of our recent past that continues to shape the lives currently of hundreds of millions of people. If you're a citizen of, of Indonesia, the right-wing military regime that the U.S. imposed by helping to murder up to a million civilians and eradicating one-third of the population of East Timor continues to exert great amounts of political influence and power today in Indonesia's political reality. And here in Brazil, the current president of the country, Jair Bolsonaro, was an army captain in the military junta imposed for 21 years by the United States after it helped jet Brazilian generals overthrow the Brazilian elected government in 1964. And there's a big movement to call for the restoration of that military regime. So many countries, obviously including North Korea, which suffered devastation by the United States during the Korean War and Vietnam, which was the same, continue to have their political reality shaped by the egregious acts of murder and mayhem and devastation wrought by the US government and by the CIA. Interference that makes what the Russians supposedly did in 2016 pale in comparison, even as American liberal elites talk about that interference as though it was some off the chart, never before seen uh, subversion. Now, it, the fact that the United States and Russia have interfered in the past in other countries far more drastically and severely than what the Russians are said to have done in 2016 doesn't mean what the Russians did it was justifiable, and it doesn't mean that people don't have the right to object and denounce it. But what it certainly does mean is that perspective and context have to be applied when understanding what it actually was. It wasn't the equivalent of Pearl Harbor or 9-11 when set against what the U.S. has done to multiple other countries. It was actually ordinary at most and probably trivial and insignificant when compared to what the U.S. has routinely done. Not just done in the past, but continues to do to adversaries such as the government of Iran and Venezuela and Cuba. In fact, The Guardian reported in 2011 that the U.S. Intelligence Committee created an entirely fake Twitter website to lure young Cubans into believing that it was the real Twitter to manipulate their thinking and to agitate and incite them to act against their government and to overthrow them. And even when it comes to Russia, the U.S. has continuously interfered in the internal affairs of that country going back to 1995 and 1996 when Time magazine on its cover boasted of the success of American political operatives in electing the preferred candidate that the United States wanted to preside over Russia, Boris Yeltsin, because they knew that he would usher in policies of neoliberalism and privatization that would aid global capital and American oligarchy. And the fact that he ended up being a disastrous drunk and a wildly corrupt uh, wrecking ball for Russia was directly the result of the fact that Americans succeeded in helping him ascend to power as they openly boasted of. And even in 2010 and 2012, under Hillary Clinton's State Department, the State Department very openly funded what they called pro-democracy groups, which were in fact ways of aiding the Russian opposition in agitating protest against the Putin government, which whether you believe is justified or moral or not, is still an act of interference in the internal affairs of Russia far greater than what Russia is said to have done in 2016. So it doesn't mean that you have to cheer for Russia when they did what they are claimed to have done in 2016, nor cede your right to object, but it certainly should mean that you have to maintain historical perspective and not fall prey, especially to American exceptionalism that says that when there's minor interference in the United States, that's the gravest crime of the 21st century, akin to Pearl Harbor and 9-11, but when the US does these little coups and murder, mass murder regimes, that's just an isolated, insignificant, unrepresented, bad act. It reminds me when I hear American liberals talking about Russian interference in 2016, 
of as if Charles Manson were to be in prison and someone were to step on his toe and he would scream bloody murder as though, oh my God, this is the worst thing that anyone has ever done to another human being. That's what, to much of the world, and I confess to me, American liberals sound like when they, in isolation, condemn what the Russians did in 2016 without a broad understanding of how that compares to what great powers, especially the United States and the CIA, have been doing to one another and to virtually every other country for decades. Now, one other point about this related is that when I first began reading about McCarthyism, and the horrors of the smear campaigns and the career destruction that it wrought for decades, I had assumed that the Democratic Party and American liberals were largely opposed to the Cold War because McCarthyism was a script, was a tactic largely deployed against American liberals by the far right for decades or even anyone associated with the Democratic Party. There were communists in the United States, but it quickly spread to labor unions and then to anyone who was vaguely socialist and then anyone vaguely liberal and then just to the Democratic Party as a whole. But that assumption that I had when I first read about McCarthyism many years ago in college was the exact opposite of the truth. Democrats and liberals have always been fanatical cold warriors. It was Harry Truman after the end of World War II who laid the foundation, the groundwork for clandestine operations and interference in other countries in the name of anti-communism. And it was John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson who ushered in what might have been the most morally grotesque act of post-World War II United States, which was the destruction of Vietnam in the name of fighting communism, and Democrats have long led support to some of the gro mo mo most extreme excesses of the Cold War. And so to watch them do that now again, using the same resuscitated script from the Cold War when it comes to Russia and accusing their political adversaries of being Kremlin agents and acting all offended at any attempt to affect American democracy by other countries while turning a blind eye, uh, turning a blind eye to the far more severe systematic acts of interference by the CIA and the U.S. intelligence community broadly is not something new for American liberals, but is something that they've been doing essentially since the end of World War II. And that, too, is a really important part of history that this book help, helps illuminate. Now, it wasn't just the continuous use of Cold War scripts that made me believe that a serious revisiting of post-World War II history and the role the CIA played in it was so necessary. It was a variety of other developments over the last four years, including the willingness of so many people simply to take the pronouncements of the CIA about Russia and about other U.S. adversaries at their word with no evidence required, simply assertions laundered through the media anonymously or other proclamations issued by CIA officials who were newly employed by TV networks that were simply deemed to be true as though the CIA was an inherently trustworthy and reliable organization. And again, at first it was mystifying to me that people would view the CIA that way given its history until they realized that it was simply a matter of not fully understanding what the CIA had done, either because people were newly arrived to politics or because they hadn't done the work necessary to free themselves of the propaganda, which were all fed about the U.S. government and the role of the U.S. Uh, of, of the role of the U.S. in the world. Other examples included the fact that the Democratic Party has now, within the last four years, all but merged with not just neocon elements, but even with the CIA community, with the intelligence community. There are new foreign policy groups that I've written about in the past in which Democratic foreign policy elites who have worked for Hillary Clinton's State Department or for Barack Obama's administration are now sitting on the same boards and have founded the same groups as not just militaristic neocons long associated with the CIA during the Bush-Cheney era, but also with CIA officials themselves. Indeed, in 2016, two separate former CIA directors, one who worked for Barack Obama and the other for George W. Bush, came out and urged that Donald Trump be defeated and that Hillary Clinton essentially be elected. Michael Morrell, President Obama's acting CIA director, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in 2016 explicitly endorsing Hillary Clinton and arguing that Donald Trump was essentially a Russian agent. And George Bush's post 9-11 NSA director and then CIA director Michael Hayden in a Washington Post op-ed didn't explicitly endorse Hillary Clinton, but he said that Donald Trump was essentially a traitor or a Russian asset and therefore urged him to be defeated. And so even there, you can see this kind of detente, this rapprochement between Democratic Party establishment liberals on the one hand and the CIA on the other. You see the same thing 
with the integration of former CIA directors like John Brennan held up as authorities on liberal foreign policy discourse and even paid to deliver the news for outlets like MSNBC, which he's done repeatedly by disseminating disinformation. For example, this week on Friday, not knowing anything about it, but Friday is the day that the grand jury indictments come down. And also this Friday is better than next Friday because next Friday is the 15th of March, which is the Ides of March. And I don't think Robert Mueller will want to have that dramatic uh, flair of the Ides of March when he is gonna be delivering what I think are gonna be his indictments, the final indictments, as well as the report that he gives the Attorney General. What makes you believe that he has more indictments? Um, because he hasn't addressed the issues related to criminal conspiracy as well as any individuals. Criminal conspiracy involving the Russian and Russians, yes, yeah. I think it was very, and, in, and in terms of an American area, person, you know, U.S. person. That's an area you know something about. That, that investigation was developing while you were still on the job. Well, it was in terms of looking at what was going on with the Russians and whether or not U.S. persons were actively collaborating, colluding, cooperating, and involved in a conspiracy with them or not. Uh, but also, if there's going to be any member of the Trump family, did you see Trump enough family, at that stage to believe that there would now that that would result in indictments once investigated? I, I th thought at the time that there was going to be individuals who were going to have uh, issues with the Department of Justice. Yes, and I think we've already seen a number of individuals who have been indicted, either have pled guilty uh, or have been convicted now. So, I, again, I don't have any inside knowledge. I'm not talking with anybody in special yes, counsels. Yes, you do. You have the inside well, knowledge. But, but of not what, about the status of, of the investigation right now. Yeah. But I do think also if anybody from the Trump family, an extended family, is going to be indicted, it would be in the final act of mm -hmm. Mueller's investigation because Bob Mueller and I think his team knows that if he were to do something, uh, indicting a Trump family member, or if he were to go forward with indictment on criminal conspiracy involving U.S. persons, that would basically be the death knell of the special counsel's office because I don't believe that Donald Trump would allow uh, Bob Mueller to continue in the aftermath of those types of actions. John Brennan, thank you very much. Uh, it, you have to listen to every word in the John Brennan answer. Thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate it. All of those incidents, all of those developments over the last four years caused me to realize that the full extent of CIA savagery and brutality was really being overlooked, whitewashed by current deliberate attempts to whitewash that history. And so Vincent Bevan's book, that examines what the CIA actually did over the last 70 to 80 years in a multitude of countries. His focus is on Indonesia, where he reported for the Post, but also secondarily Brazil, Guatemala, Gu Guatemala, Vietnam, Chile, a whole variety of other countries where coups were instigated, where disinformation campaigns were disseminated, where dictators were trained and supported and propped up, really sheds an important light on what the CIA actually has always been, was created to be, and still is. You see it now with destabilization campaigns in countries and governments that the United States dislikes, whether it's Iran or Venezuela or Cuba or other places as well, including, ironically, in Russia. Now, for me, one of the uh, eye-opening trajectories that I had when I first, early on, started writing about politics in 2005, by which point I had just started living in Brazil, was I had studied and read a lot about the 1964 coup in Brazil, in which the democratically elected center-left president, João Goulart, was overthrown by Brazilian generals acting in concert, crucial reliance and support from the CIA. And that instituted a 21-year brutal military dictatorship in Brazil, which for two decades had been developing a burgeoning democracy at the heart of Latin America. And I had always assumed when I first started thinking about this coup and other coups, such as the one in Guatemala, such as what happened in Indonesia, that the United States, even though it was immoral and even though it was unethical and even though it created poor outcomes, was at least targeting actual communist leaders based on the misguided belief that if they didn't topple communist regimes, that it would strengthen Moscow and could ultimately in parallel American democracy. And one of the things I realized first in Brazil and then in multiple other countries was that the president of Brazil, that first the Kennedy administration and then the Johnson administration decided they couldn't tolerate was nowhere near 
a dogmatic communist with loyalty to Moscow. In fact, Brazil had been trying for 20 years very diligently to remain independent. They were part of what would, had been called a non-aligned movement, or back then even what was used in a non-derogatory way, in fact, a complementary way, the third world, meaning not the first world of Europe, nor the second world of the Soviet Union, but the third world, a new way of doing things, and try to remain free of loyalty or allegiance either to Moscow or to Washington, but any kind of efforts to reform the free market, to take the edges off capitalism like President Goulart in Brazil did through his incrementalist center-left politics like modest land reform and rent control and expansion of social programs is viewed as a threat to Washington, as viewed as a possible communist insurgency in the largest country in Latin America. They warned him multiple times, and when he continued to exercise his sovereignty, they finally worked with Brazilian generals to overthrow Brazilian democracy and the democratically elected government and install a right-wing military dictatorship that remained loyal to Washington and brutally tortured and killed dissidents and imprisoned people and took away every last civil liberty in Brazil and in countries all over the world that repeated itself in far worse ways. Brazil was actually a mild case despite how horrific it was and probably the most horrific example is also one of the least appreciated and understood, which is what the United States did in Indonesia, where there was a burgeoning and inspirational movement to free Indonesia first of colonial rule and then from control, colonial control by either of the two superpowers in Washington or Moscow. It became the centerpiece of the effort to create a non-aligned world of African and Asian countries. And this alone was just such an immense threat to the United States, not because they were pursuing dogmatic communism, nor because they were loyal to Moscow, quite the contrary, because they were staking out their own independent course, which Washington deemed to be threatening, and through tactics that were incredibly brutal, limitlessly savage and murderous, Washington, the CIA, through the CIA, helped overthrow the democratically elected leader of Indonesia, the government, the military with leaders with whom they work, proceeded to kill between 500,000 and a million civilians in Indonesia, and then proceeded to extinguish one third of the population of East Timor. It's been called the largest unrecognized mass killing of the 20th century, the 1965 massacre of communists in Indonesia, a dark chapter of Cold War history. An international panel of judges delivers its conclusion. The state of Indonesia is responsible for and guilty of crimes against humanity. The violence began the night of September 30th, 1965, when soldiers mutinied and murdered at least six army generals and their relatives in a failed military coup. A military regime led by General Suharto responded with a systematic campaign to wipe out communists from Indonesia. Suharto went on to rule the country for the next 31 years. In its ruling, the International People's Tribunal found the state of Indonesia guilty for the massacre of an estimated 400,000 people. Other crimes against humanity include wide-scale torture, enslavement, enforced disappearance, and systematic acts of sexual violence against women linked to the Communist Party. The judges also implicated the Suharto regime's Cold War allies. The United States of America, the United Kingdom, and Australia were all complicit to different degrees in the commission of these crimes against humanity. The U.S. gave sufficient support to the Indonesian military, knowing well that they were embarked upon a program of mass killings and other criminal conduct None of the countries have responded to the finding. Last May, survivors of the deadly 1965 crackdown emerged from an historic meeting with a top Indonesian official. He leads a government commission to investigate the violence, but he casts doubt on the scale of the killings. I don't believe that number of uh, people get killed back to 1965. Uh, some people say 400,000 or so. The International People's Tribunal was formed in response to the 2012 Oscar-nominated documentary, The Act of Killing. It profiled Indonesian gangsters who boast how they murdered communists in 1965. But the Indonesian government says the tribunal 
has no jurisdiction over the island nation. Jakarta insists it will use Indonesia's own legal system to investigate this painful period of history. Ivan Watson, CNN. It's Timor, that is something that repeated itself in Vietnam and then in Guatemala, in the Philippines, and in so many other places around the world. Events that if you don't understand and don't fully appreciate, you can't really comprehend what our modern world is, what the United States has become, how and why it's become that, and what the CIA continues to do. So I read this book believing that it was going to be a rehash of a history that I had become more or less familiar with. And what I actually found was that by stripping away all of the adjectives from this recounting of history, there's very few places where Bevins in this book ever expresses any emotions of indignation or moral outrage or disgust. He just lets the facts speak for themselves, and they're so horrific that they produce a much more potent form of indignation. By the end of the book, all of the propaganda is stripped away about what the United States has done in the post-World War II era. The effort to believe that occasionally the United States made errors, but always well-intentioned, or that the errors were just isolated instances as opposed to who representative of what American identity is and who and what we are, is just simply unsustainable. And so I really encourage you to read this book um, because it will forever preclude you from wearing those blinders ever again. And those blinders impede our ability to meaningfully understand and navigate through current politics. So here's my discussion with Vincent Bevins, who has traveled the world in an effort to really understand this. He's interviewed thousands of people, read through countless now declassified documents. He's traveled to the countries that he's writing about. He delved into their history and culture and politics in order to better understand them and has produced, at least for me, the most comprehensive account of what the CIA has done and is in the post-World War II era, and therefore how to understand the role that the CIA continues to play in our lives in shaping our perceptions of the world and shaping American identity. I hope you really enjoy the book, and I hope you enjoy our discussion as well. Joining me now to discuss the history of the CIA in the post-World War II order and the role more generally of the United States is somebody who served as the foreign correspondent for six years covering Brazil for the Los Angeles Times, and after that covering Indonesia for the Washington Post. And he's the author of a new and very provocative and uh, compelling book uh, entitled The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade and the Mass Murder Program that Shaped Our World. As you can tell from the title, it's some light quarantine reading. Vincent Bevins, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on. Sure. So, um, if we could just begin by talking about the title. Um, this the subtitle is is pretty clear and and pretty stark. What is though the Jakarta method in this context? So the book is about the mass murder of approximately one million innocent civilians in Indonesia, and this is one of the biggest uh, turning points of the Cold War, perhaps the the biggest victory for. The United States and the system that it wanted to construct. And this was such an obvious victory to other US-backed right-wing allies throughout the world that they began to copy methods from Indonesia. And Jakarta was the word that they used to, de to designate these, these programs. So in Chile, Brazil, possibly Central America, we have Jakarta programs or Operation Jakarta or the Jakarta Plan, which is inspired by this monumental victory for the anti-communist crusade in the 20th century. So let's talk a little bit uh, before we delve into some broader themes about specifically what happened in Indonesia. I do think it's interesting that even people steeped in kind of the history of the CIA from a critical perspective often are familiar with things like the overthrow of the Iranian government, um, the uh, propping up the Shah in his place, maybe some of the Central American and Latin American uh, coups and death squads in El Salvador and Nicaragua and Chile. Um, but tend not to be all that familiar with what happened in Indonesia, even though arguably it's one of the most gruesome and amoral and murderous episodes in the history of the CIA, if not the single worst. So can you just kind of sketch for people, assume that people know very little to nothing about what the CIA actually did in Indonesia in the 1950s and heading into the 1960s, the kind of full scope of what we're talking about? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it's not only the most gruesome, I think it's one of the most important. And I found when I moved out there, 
when I would talk about this to people back in uh, like the West, broadly speaking, no, they really had no idea. So Indonesia was a, an extremely important country in the 40s, 50s, and 60s in the construction of the Third World Movement, which was, you know, now we use the term Third World in a derogatory way, but at the time it was this attempt to bring all the countries of the post-colonial world together and sort of stand up to the West and take their place on the stage, on the world stage. So Indonesia is the former Dutch colonies, uh, 13,000 islands, and it came together under this president named Sukarno, who was a left-leaning, independent, but not communist uh, leader. Um, and under his early years of a parliamentary multi-party dictatorship, or sorry, parliamentary multi-party democracy, um, the Indonesian Communist Party, which is one of the oldest in Asia, starts doing better and better. And the CIA, which is fresh off of its big victories in Iran in 53 and Guatemala in 54, starts trying to come up with a way to stop the rise of this Communist Party, which is winning elections. And it's important to stress that they were always unarmed. They never had any sort of revolutionary theory about taking power through violence. So in 1955, and they have you, their you, first... You, had, you actually talked about how their agenda explicitly was that they probably couldn't even have real socialism in Indonesia until the end of the century. They were very incrementalist despite their name, right? Yeah, exactly. So they were like very old school Orthodox um, Marxists in a sense that we kind of forget about now. Like you could imagine them becoming like the German SPD where they took the parliamentary road and just stayed as part of the system forever. But of course, the CIA did not want them to exist at all. So they were doing better and better in elections. In 1955, the CIA starts giving a lot of money to a conservative Muslim party, Masyumi. That doesn't work. They keep winning elections. So in 1958, the CIA bombs the country, organizes um, aerial raids over the islands, dropping bombs on um, civilians, killing innocent people. And one of the pilots is caught. So this guy named Alan Pope gets captured on the island of Ambon. And all of the left side of Indonesian politics who had been saying this whole time, I think the CIA is trying to destroy our country. They're right. They're proved right. Sukarno moves further to the left, a little bit closer to the Soviet Union, but he's still trying to maintain this sort of independent stance while the Communist Party is now but, but, well, let me, let me by just far stop the you biggest quick. force. Let me just so stop you there quickly for a yeah. little, bit of, of, of little bit of clarification. So you had just yes. said that the left, the Indonesian left began suspecting the CIA, but in the early years of Sukarno's presidency and the emergence of this movement in post-colonial Indonesia of a kind of communist party and to the left, was their posture towards the United States hostile and aggressive and saying, we're going to align with Moscow, our kind of communist masters, or what was their, were they provocative toward Washington or what was their posture toward, toward the United States? No. And this was very common in the third world at the time. And even, even amongst the explicitly communist parties, they tried very hard to be friends with the United States. So in this 1955 Bandung conference where they brought together all the countries of Asia and Africa to sort of create their own unity um, in, within the third world. This is the first intercontinental conference of colored peoples, so-called colored peoples in the history of mankind. I am proud that my country is your host. It is a new departure in the history of the world that leaders of Asian and African peoples can meet together in their own countries to discuss and deliberate upon matters of common concern. They explicitly sort of talked about Paul Revere and talked about the American revolutionary legacy. And this was very obviously an attempt for them to say, hey, you know, like we're doing what you did. Like we just got our independence. We want our own path. Like, please don't demonize us. And this was this happened across Asia. I mean, even Ho Chi Minh, who was a communist and it was very hard nosed about what he wanted. He his in declaration of independence from France celebrated and cited the U.S. Declaration of Independence because he was hoping that this could work out. So. For a long time, Sukarno was considered in Washington as somebody that was an acceptable partner. At the very least, he wasn't causing too much trouble. Um, but with the presidency of Eisenhower, after the successes in Iran and Guatemala, after the Bandung conference, and as they see the Indonesian Communist Party is just doing better and better and better, and we, we have declassified CIA files now, 
that indicate they knew that the reason they were winning is because they were the best party organizationally, right? So they were going out and talking to people and doing all the things that you should do as a party. And this was a very big problem. So from 55 can, to 58, can you just, can you they just brief, with all can, kinds can you just of wild briefly speak? talk about, because yeah. yeah, I mean, just let me, let me just stop you there for one sec, because um, it's one of the things that struck me in your book, which is obviously there's a lot of grappling right now you know, throughout the democratic world with left-wing populism or just left-wing parties with an inability to succeed democratically. Um, the country that we're both in, in Brazil, is a good example. Right. So is the United States, so is the United Kingdom and throughout Western Europe. What is it that they were doing, the, to the Communist Party, to reach you know, people who weren't steeped in Marxist theory, who weren't, you know, kind of elites in academic institutions studying the works of Hegel and Marx. Like, what were they doing that was making their their uh, political project appealing to um, the working class and the like? Are there lessons to learn from that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the, the final lesson it might not be uh, a, a, an easy one to, to, to stomach. But so they had they had outreach programs to every segment of society. So they had a peasant program. They had a women's movement, which was maybe the most important feminist movement in the world at the time. They had a cultural organization. So in your village, if there was like a play that was being put on, it was probably somehow related to the Communist Party. And they would go out and they would sort of say, oh, you're a peasant. This is what the law is. These are your rights. Um, we're going to fight for better rights. But for now, like we're going to show you how to work within the system. And by the early 60s, almost 25 to 30 percent of the country was in one of these affiliated organizations. And we know... Um, again, like there wasn't any more elections, but the CIA knew that they would win for sure an election if there was one. But after the CIA invasion in 58, where their guy gets caught, they shift tactics and they start forming really deep ties with the military um, from 1958 to 1965 until there's this eruption, a clash that the officials from Washington definitely wanted to happen. We know from declassified information they were trying to make a clash between the communists and the army happen. We don't know exactly who planned it or how this clash came to be, but we know that as a result of this clash, the United States began to actively assist in the extermination of approximately you know, 500,000 to a million or more than a million innocent people. And the really difficult thing about this when I was meeting all these people is that they had no idea that they could be in trouble for anything. They turned themselves in, they were like, yeah, I'll go get, do an interview down at the police station. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm in the teacher's union. You know, what's, you know, that's fine. And, um, and I think that the reason we don't know about this is because precisely because it was so successful, right? So if you look at Vietnam, that cost a lot of American lives. That was an embarrassment. We didn't really win. Whereas in Indonesia, the success was so complete and happened in such a terrible way that nobody really talked about it anymore. And the whole point of killing a million people like that in that horrible way where you don't know what happened to your family or what happened to your your friends is that people don't want to talk about what ha what happened what they were doing and to this day in indonesia people are reticent to talk about it so a very big difference between sort of south american victims of dictatorship is that people in indonesia are still suffering right they have not been given the basic gesture of forgiveness there's it's illegal to say what really happened um and i think this traces back to the fact that it was such a complete and horrible victory for the the West and the Cold War. So one of the things that is is kind of gruesomely fascinating about that that narrative is that I think even those of us who kind of were steeped in the true Cold War history, meaning not the kind that were taught in middle school and high school, that the United States battled this evil, evil uh, communist ideology and won, but even if you're aware that the CIA did a lot of bad things, we're taught, you know, in that kind of next stage that the reason they were doing that is because they wanted to preserve the ability for people around the world to live more or less freely, free of religious oppression that communists brought, free of yeah. um, an elimination of economic freedom, and just in general enjoy democracy. And yet here in Indonesia was yeah. a case where exactly the opposite thing was true, right? That the worry of the CIA and the United States government was precisely not to allow democracy to take root because they knew if it did, they right. would end up electing parties and leaders that the United States government perceived as being adverse to its interests. So what kind of government 
ended up after this mass slaughter of 500,000 to a million people, what kind of government ended up taking root and what was the U.S. role in it? Yeah, so it was sort of a what is now probably more familiar to to like educated people in the West. It was a military backed dictatorship that suppressed all um, uh, suppressed anything that could be remotely left wing. So like you couldn't use a sickle in the farm because hammers and sickles were um, illegal. You had a million people in concentration camps. Uh, Chinese um, people were repressed. There's an ethnic Chinese minority. The Chinese characters were banned. But it was very much something that you kind of would imagine in a South American dictatorship, and that's not a coincidence, right? So all of these people, the South American dictators and the Indonesian generals that ended up taking over in 1965, had all studied together in Kansas during this period at which the United States was making an active outreach to the militaries of the third world. And so this Suharto, this dictatorship, the, the Suharto dictatorship, keeping a million people in concentration camps throughout the 60s and 70s while being a huge friend to U.S. officials and U.S. corporations. In 1975, he uses anti-communism as an excuse to invade East Timor, killing up to one third of the population of that country, which is a higher percentage than Pol Pot killed in Cambodia. And this one, this was the, the, a major Cold War ally in, in, in Asia until after the, until 1998, the, the, the government finally comes apart. But the military, and this is the, the exact same, um, I mean, I spent the last three years living there, they still very much are in charge of the country. And this is, there's a direct lineage. There's no break between this moment in 1965 where they kill their enemies, take over in a, a US-backed dictatorship, uh, there's no there's no dividing line between that and now. It's still it's it's a continuous uh, regime. So let me ask you um, about the kind of conclusions that we can draw from not just what happened in Indonesia, but as the title of your book indicates, uh, uh, some things that were replicated in many parts throughout the world. There was a little brouhaha last week where um, William Barr in an interview said when asked how history was going to view the Flynn case and Russiagate and all that. And he right. made a comment like the Victor Wright is, is who writes history. Um, and the Twitter controversy erupted because people cut out the interview and he went on to caveat that and kind of indicate he was joking. But the, the reason why that does bother people and rightfully so is because it makes it seem as though the actual events don't really matter historically that, that the, most powerful factions, the ones that emerge victorious, have the ability to completely reshape the truth and repackage it as propaganda and feed it to people for so many years. And so obviously the United States being the most powerful country in the world by far since the end of World War II, and particularly since the fall of the Soviet Union, has really had the ability to rewrite history. And so you get to the point where even if you tell people about things like you just mentioned, and let's just underscore how extreme it is, right? Like 500,000 to a million human beings exterminated who are innocent, and then a third of the population of East Timor extinguished. You can get people to say, okay, I realize the CIA did some, made some mistakes or even did some really terrible things, but yeah, yeah. it was in the broader context of this noble or at least morally justifiable or reasonable project of preserving democracy and freedom for the world against communist oppression. Having spent all the time that you spent delving into these really horrifying and gruesome facts over the last several years to write this book, how would you describe overall the role of the United States in the world from the end of World War II through the end of the 20th century? Yeah, um, that that he said that really was really disturbing to me because a lot of people that that use that sort of ax, the, that uh, adage, history is written but written by the victors. They say it in a very critical way, like it's supposed to be a problem. Whereas he was saying, seemed to be saying, like, well, as long as I have power, I'll be able to erase whatever I've done. So to answer your question, I think that, I mean, I think the first, second, and third world division is really useful, even though it's fallen out of fashion. So at the end of World War II, there was the first world, which was all former imperial powers, right? This is Western Europe, the United States, and the United States was imperialist in the Western Hemisphere, even though we don't like to think so much about that legacy. Then we had the second world, which was the communist, uh, you know, the Soviet-aligned Eastern Bloc and their, their sphere of influence. And then there was the third world, which is the vast majority of humanity. And I think there was kind of a turning point right after World War II where there was a question well, will the United States sort of take this path 
that would be suggested by its revolutionary values? Or will it kind of fall into the same structural position that imperial Western Europe had been in for hundreds of years? And whether or not this was going, always going to happen, whether or not it was individual decisions, I think we ended up falling into that second position. And you mentioned sort of the, the broad narrative about the Cold War. We now know that that's wrong, right? So we now know, for example, we have declassified files about the coup in Guatemala, and we can see what they were saying behind the scenes. They said, we know this is not a threat. We know this government is not going to pose any kind of problem to us or even really to the Guatemalan people. The problem in Guatemala, according to the words of this, the State Department itself, was that it could set an example for other Latin American countries. If they were successful, everyone else would want to do that too, and that was unacceptable. And I mean, that, that's, that's like the kind of thing a conspiracy theorist would say, and I would have never believed it until I read the stuff myself. But I think for, you know, after the beginning of the 50s, it was, it was fairly clear to leaders in Washington, well, where we don't have political influence, we'll have to use the influence we do have, which is a lot of guns and a lot of money to sort of make sure the world that we're trying to form happens in a broad way without people challenging it too much. And in, I mean, in, in Chile in 1970, in when Allende won, we have similar declassified documents. The idea that really scared Nixon's administration was that democratic socialism would be successful in, in Chile. And this well, is, again, well, this well, is where me, we let get... Me, let me ask you about that, because yeah. I've always been fascinated by this question, because the, you know, you, if you steep yourself in the history of the Vietnam War, um, which I personally first did uh, long, many years ago by watching this extraordinary 13-part documentary from PBS, um, I wasn't alive during most of the Vietnam War, so I had to go back and really delve into it. Um, it's on YouTube, and I really encourage people to watch it. And you, you kind of get wrapped up in all the details and the battles and the, you know, I mean, war criminality and the extinguishing of the civilians by the hundreds of thousands. And then kind of you reach the point at the end, and you're like, wait, well, why did that happen, right? Like, Vietnam was not a geostrategically important country using classic metrics. It didn't have a lot of oil. Why was the United States so obsessed with controlling the kind of system of government that Vietnam have? And you can ask the same question of a lot of these other countries, maybe most, that became battlegrounds of the, the CIA in the United States, including Guatemala and, and arguably Indonesia. Although, you know, each one has some strategic importance. They're not critical the way, say, Iran but was. Um, is that the reason that even in Vietnam and, and then maybe in Guatemala that they, the United States is simply afraid that some of these alternative forms of political orders were going to succeed and therefore inspire other countries to follow them and they had to just prevent success? I mean, I don't like to think like that, right? I didn't, I mean, I don't, I didn't move to Indonesia sort of looking for a way to like come at the nature of U.S. hegemony, you know, like I kind of stumbled upon this, but like, that's what they said, you know, like I, I cite the documents in the book and they say this. So in, in Chile and Guatemala, we have that. I mean, and George Kennan, I think in 1948, he said something like, we have 6% of the world's population, but 50% of its wealth. Our goal is to keep it that way and make sure that there is no opposition to such a system. And so I think there's a lot of elements working together, right? So I met the, interviewed a few times the son of the guy who sort of created the CIA covert operations program at the very beginning. And he believes that his father believed he was fighting communism. And I also believe that he believed that, right? But I also believe that US corporations that had big interests in Iran or in Guatemala or in, in Indonesia was, was very important. Oil was very big and gold was very big. Yeah. Um, Indonesia was probably not a demonstration effect. Indonesia was, was the country. And I think that those, these three things come together. You have these people that really believe they're fighting a, a holy war, right? And you have to remember also, if you want to be sympathetic to them, it helps to remember that they were fighting the Nazis before. So maybe they thought, oh, there's this enemy is like the last one. We have to do absolutely anything, you know, get the press to lie for us, kill innocent people, it's, anything's worth it. You, they have the, the belief in the holy war, the influence of the big companies that have obviously to this day, and you know, no one really disputes this, that the more money you have, the more influence you have over the US government. And then third, these, these more long-term strategic think thinkers saying, well, you can't let Allende do democratic socialism in the middle of South America. Everyone else will want to do that. And that is, that is the moment when they sort of put in the, the Jakarta terror plan in, in 1970 in Chile. 
but yeah, I didn't, I didn't like stumbling upon, I mean, finding those documents, but it's, yeah, that's yeah. what they said. Yeah, exactly. I was, and, it, and it ultimately probably is the only thing that really explains why these things happen in the places that they happen. Let me try and if I can get you to connect this very, what, what seems like distant history, but in fact is very recent history um, that we're talking about things that took place under Eisenhower and then Kennedy and, and Johnson and Nixon, you know, into the, the end of the Cold War under Reagan as well, um, to our current foreign policy debates and our current politics. I saw this really interesting uh, excerpt from a Lindsey Graham speech earlier uh, today or yesterday where he was condemning what he regards as the abuses by the FBI in the case of Russiagate broadly, but Michael Flynn's prosecution specifically in light of these new documents that have emerged. And he said, you know, I'm really shocked by this. This is J. Edgar Hoover stuff. And I want to show him the sign that continues to hang in front of the FBI headquarters, which continues to be named after J. Edgar Hoover. It's the J. J. Edgar Hoover FBI headquarters, right. which he must have passed by a thousand times. It's not like the J. Edgar Hoover FBI is some fabled, you know, mythology of the past. I mean, it's 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 still literally named after the person who oversaw those abuses because there's continuity, obviously, in terms of at least the institutional identity. Is that true for the CIA? I mean, a lot of people, if you tell them about what the CIA did in Indonesia and in Latin America and Central America and Vietnam, the scope of the slaughter, even if you convince them, you kind of, you know, wrench out of their hands the moral justification that it was necessary to fight communism. The kind of last resort of people who want to cling to American exceptionalism or at least a, a story of American goodness in the world is that, oh, those things were done in the past. You know, if you talked, I remember during the Russiagate uh, debate, if you talked about CIA interference in the way the CIA interferes way more than, you know, some Facebook ads and Twitter bots and even email leaks, people would say, sure, we overthrew Iran in 1954 as though that's a thing of the past that the CIA no longer does. Is that true? Like, is the Jakarta method and the tactics that were invoked in these countries that your book so ex uh, adeptly covers, things of the past, or do you think that they're things that still shape the role that the CIA plays in the world? So I don't know what the CIA is doing right now, but the question that I always have for people that want to tell me, oh, that was in the past, is I always say, well, when was the line that they stopped, right? What was, so what, what was the point at which they stopped doing all the things that they were founded to do in the first place? And what evidence do I have that that line was a real break, right? So, I mean, what I know is I spent a lot of time looking at the, the intelligence we now have about the 50s and 60s and 70s. And what I know is that that's the, the moments in history about which we have declassified information, we anyone that would read that would go, whoa, that is very bad stuff that I did not know that they were doing. I don't know why not to believe that now. But I also don't know. I mean, that's the nature of covert operations, right? Like, What's happening right now? I know, do I think that in 15, 20 years we're going to find out that the U.S. right now is doing something horrible? I think it's possible. But I don't, the, that's the question I was asking. Like, what was the I mean, We do know that they're interfering, right? Like we know there's covert operations right. to undermine various governments around the world in Venezuela, in Cuba, in Iran, in a lot of places. You just don't know whether they're using the same exact tactics. Well, I don't, I mean, I don't think that the, for example, the, like the, the, the mass murder programs and I sort of, I outlined, there's like 20 at least from 1945 to, to 2000 of us backed mass murder programs for innocent civilians. I don't I mean, we would know if that was happening, right? We, that's, right. I don't think that is happening. But what I do know is that when the cold war ended, we didn't ratchet, we didn't roll back our military spending. We didn't stop messing around with countries in Latin America. Um, the war in Iraq, you know, the U S intelligence, uh, services were very deeply involved in making that tragedy happen, which killed as many people as died in Indonesia approximately. So I'm just very, I think that we have this sort of, I mean, I grew up, you know, we're both from the United States and I think we grew up with this kind of almost faith that we always reset to doing the right thing, right? I mean, there's almost like this deep epistemological training we have where it's like, well, yeah, yeah, like it was like that, but it can't be like that now. But I just don't I don't see the evidence for that break. I mean, what, you know, I would, I would be happy to hear when it was because there, in you know, 1975, there was the church uh, commission. And that's why we know so much about uh, Nixon's crimes, which is why people hear people hear less about Kennedy and LBJ era stuff 
rather than they do about Nixon era stuff because of the because of Watergate and because of Church Commission. And this is sort of, you know, relevant to my book. But that didn't stop, you know, the death squads in Latin America. That was after that, you know, um, Iraq was, you know, in the early 2000s. So I don't I don't know where that break is supposed to have be or why I'm supposed to think that it was decisive. You you have a section of the book where you do discuss why a lot of this history, despite how obviously consequential it is, not just in terms of the shape, the, the trajectory of history, but also in terms of the identity of the United States, has been overlooked or kind of written out of our history books or somehow effectively excluded from how we conceive of ourselves as Americans. And there's this one passage that, that drew my attention where you write, quote, I know from 13 years of working as a foreign correspondent and journalist that faraway countries that are stable and reliably pro-American do not make headlines. I fear that the truth of what happened contradicts so forcefully our idea of what the Cold War was, of what it means to be an American, of how globalization has taken place, that it has simply been easier to ignore it, meaning this history that we've been discussing. What do you mean when you say that faraway countries that are stable and reliably pro-American do not make headlines? Yeah, so Indonesia in Indonesia in the 50s and 60s was causing problems for the United States. It was It was sort of opposed to the creation of the kind of world order that was taking shape. And that is, that's news, that's a problem. But when it apparently naturally enters the large group of countries that like us, that are capitalists, that are part of the free world, that doesn't raise any eyebrows, right? Like there is this narrative that, oh yeah, all the countries are joining this US led new capitalist order. Um, And it's only the ones that are sort of out like opposed to that, they're the minority. Um, and it's very hard to recognize that, no, for a lot of the countries that joined this order, it was not a natural voluntary thing. It was very forcefully imposed. And like um, the second part of that passage, like I feel very like stupid or guilty complaining about this, but because I spent so much time with people that like still are suffering really bad to this day from having all their families killed and having no sort of rights. But it was like, it was very hard to go through this stuff. I mean, it was like there was a, a deep sort of cognitive dissonance um, that really sort of was hard to live through. And it kind of shook my idea of what globalization is and what my identity is as, as an American. And like, I could see why you wouldn't want to think about it. You know, it's not nice. And so if it's not causing a problem, if it's not sort of making waves, it's though I think you get, think those things like that get pushed sort of into a memory hole. It's it's hard to live knowing, you know, Looking, you know, you and I are both like from, a, you know, the wealthiest country on earth, and we're very, very comfortable compared to all the world's people. To, you know, compared to probably ninety-eight percent of the world's people, it's not nice to think, well, is that because my government killed people? Is that part of the reason? It's not a nice thought to look into, and so part of the reason I think this history was suppressed for so long is because Suharto's government did suppress, like they they hid what they did. And it's also just very hard to integrate into our idea of what the U.S.-led era is. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the role of the media um, in in the Cold War, because you spend a good amount of time with a lot of these incidents documenting how the relationship between the U.S. government on the one hand and the most mainstream media outlets on the other um, was very close. And, and there was oftentimes cases where newspapers would knowingly suppress the truth at the behest of the U.S. government. I Uh, found really interesting this contrast that you drew between what had started off as a small, scrappy, kind of left-wing, soft communist paper in Indonesia um, called The People's Daily. And and you wrote, quote, The People's Daily reported on the events in Iran and the Philippines, of course. Even though Washington's real activities were secret at the time, Zane's newspaper, the person who founded that or was the key foreign correspondent for it, and the global left-wing press were often closer to getting the story of Washington's interventions right than U.S. newspapers, which largely saw it as their duty to peddle the official line that Wisner, who was the pioneer of the CIA's covert operations, and his team passed on to them. And you will cite this specific example um, of the New York Times, um, and I believe the context was Guatemala, where you say, quote, there's a reason for that. Sidney Grusin, an enterprising Times correspondent, was planning to launch an investigation of the rebel forces, the ones that in Guatemala that were CIA-backed, they were calling rebels, but in fact were CIA-backed, you know, people trying to subvert democracy. Frank Wisner of the CIA wanted 
that stopped. He asked the reporter's boss, uh, or he asked his own boss of the CIA, Alan Dulles, to speak with the New York Times hires up, which he did, believing he was performing a patriotic act. Times publisher Arthur Salzberger ordered Gruson to stay away. Now, obviously, there's a lot of concern, and there has been a lot of critique as independent media has arisen throughout the war on terror and over the last four years with Russiagate about the relationship between the largest media outlets and kind of the security state, the CIA. What was that relationship like during the Cold War? So in that era, so from 1945 to 75 to, you know, the, 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 the when all of the CIA crimes kind of, kind of came out, there was almost an automatic belief that, well, whatever the U.S. foreign policy apparatus is doing, we should kind of be helping. And that was the most explicit example. But in a lot of cases, and yeah, like going through that Communist Party newspaper in Malaysia and looking at what the New York Times was writing about Iran and, and Guatemala, it was it was remarkable the extent to which they collaborated. And I think there was a change in, in 1975. So there was a moment in the U.S. when media outlets including the most mainstream and sort of perhaps instinctively pro-establishment, realized, oh, well, CIA stuff can be very bad. But I don't think you see a complete reconfiguration, right? You don't see, I think that most English language, you know, mainstream media in the United States, you know, we're American, like we instinctively deep down sort of assume beforehand that we're the good guys. And I think that part hasn't changed. But there was a break, I think, with the, with, in, in the middle of the 70s where, because again, like this, the uh, World War II is, is important, right? Because all these guys came up fighting Nazis. And you could see how if you fought Nazis, you would think that, well, anything is worth victory, right? Like they're, they really want to conquer the whole world. They're going to kill everybody. We'll all, we're all in this together. And they kind of took this attitude against this um, like very amorphous communist threat, which was not really actually as internationally coordinated as they thought, and they and they sort of impose that um, on the whole world, and yeah, the the for the first 30 years of the Cold War, uh, the, the 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 media was pretty much willing to help. Yeah, um, well, let's talk about that though. The the nature of the threat that either they thought they were fighting when they were committing all these atrocities or that they knew they weren't fighting, but claimed they were fighting for propagandistic purposes domestically to sustain all the money and the power needed to uh, justify this Cold War. Um, you know, one of the things you alluded to earlier that has always amazed me ever since I really began thinking about it was I had always assumed, you know, like in college, even as I was reading about the Cold War and was even being kind of critical of it, that at the least, at the very least, the people they were targeting with coups and with CIA-backed um, overthrows and uh, paramilitary action and executions and all kinds of atrocities were genuinely hardcore communists who they were afraid were going to institute some form of Soviet-type Stalinist uh, repression and that that was going to spread. And they were particularly concerned about that in Central America and, Latin and South America because of it being through the Monroe Doctrine in the eyes of U.S. policymakers in the back door of the United States or the backyard of the United States. And one of the things that first really started opening my eyes about the falsity of that narrative was when I started looking into what actually happened in Brazil, where the, in 1964, the CIA worked with military generals, as you detail in the book, to overthrow Brazil's democratically elected government. And the president at that time, uh, President Goulart, was not a hardcore communist or a communist at all. He was kind of this center-left reformist who was doing some rent control and some land reform that was infuriating Washington. And it always, you know, the same thing as you document in, in Indonesia and, and, and Guatemala. And it, so it did lead me always to wonder, well, what was the, like, how did they get Americans to be willing to support these kind of endless hot wars and actual wars and all this clandestine operation? And you have this passage in your book where you talk about how the threat was relentlessly exaggerated. And you say the right. specific kind of anti-communism that took shape in these years was partly based on value judgments. The widespread belief in the United States that communism was simply a bad system or morally repugnant even when effective. But it was also based on a number of assertions about the nature of Soviet-led international communism. There was widespread belief that Stalin wanted to invade Western Europe. It became accepted as fact that the Soviets were pushing for revolution worldwide and that whenever communists were present, even in small numbers, they probably had secret plans to overthrow the government. It was considered 
gospel, gospel that anywhere communists were acting, they were doing so in the orders of the Soviet Union, part of a monolithic global conspiracy to destroy the West. Most of this was simply untrue. Much of the rest was greatly exaggerated. So let me ask you, with regard, first of all, to that Cold War narrative, what parts were untrue and greatly exaggerated? And then also, do you see similarities in terms of how those threats were exaggerated about they want worldwide conquest, they want to export their ideology beyond their borders, to the way in which first Russia and now China are again being villainized um, in the West now that al-Qaeda and ISIS and the lure of Islamic radicalism has kind of faded away in the public imagination? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, this could be because, I mean, I might not be, I might not be, I might have lost my objectivity here because I spent three years sort of with my head buried in the worst aspects of this, um, this exaggeration, this conflict in the 20th century. But when I see the way that we talk about, I mean, Odd Arn Westad, who's this Harvard historian, I mean, a lot of the, the narrative that I, that I rely upon as the sort of the bones of the, of the story is not really new, right? So like academic historians, this, is, this has been sort of established that, you know, this view of, you know, the US sort of ended up being, a, uh, acting like an imperial power and always having an enemy. This is not just mine. So Adarn West had a very good historian at Harvard. He kind of looks at the United States. He takes a big step back and he says, well, when has the United States ever not been engaged in aggressive militarism with somebody? And there's been no, there's no, there has not been a moment, right? So. Um, I th and we all, you know, we get in these ways of thinking, like the way that I described that the CIA viewed the Nazis, and so the next guys had to be the Nazis, right? And so after the Cold War ended, we found our new enemy, which is, you know, international Islamic terrorism, um, which, you know, there are, there were absolutely Islamic terrorists, but was it a global conspiracy that was threatening to destroy the United States? No. Um, after Donald Trump won the election, very much shocking, I think, um, uh, liberal elites in the United States, it was very easy to just to grab, well, maybe it's a monolithic international conspiracy, and that's not to deny that Vladimir Putin is a bad actor at home and abroad, but I think we, it, it works for um, elites in the United States to always have this narrative, and it also just kind of works psychologically, like it, it just fits, you know, we, we remember how bad the Soviet Union was, we remember that Rocky, whatever the Rocky movie where there's the evil Russian guy, every Russian's evil, and we just kind of slot in new characters into pre-existing holes, and again, I don't know what the world would be like if China were to take over all of the power that we have one for one, I don't know what, if it has to be like that or if it will be like that, it might be better, it might be worse, but I'm not sure why it's effective for the United States to get very worried about that and um, act like it has a way to fix it. Because just because you see, you know, just because there's a bad actor out there doesn't mean that treating it as the thing you have to do something about right now is going to make things better rather than worse. And this is the case, you know, in the Cold War, in the war on terrorism. And I'm not sure if we'll actually start a Cold War with China because I don't know if it makes sense. Um, strategically for people in power, but you have to ask, like, you know, you know, China's GDP is one sixth, China, China, sorry, China, China's GDP per capita is one sixth of the United States, right? So while they have way more people, we are still way, way richer than them, way more powerful militarily. And I think you have to ask, at what point did it become the narrative that they're a big threat, right? What happened in the last two months? Well, what happened in the last two months is that we looked very stupid and incapable dealing with a global pandemic and other countries look better, right? I mean, I mean, I think China is not blameless for the way that they handled the pandemic in the early days, but I think the real thing that is freaking out people in Washington and in New York is that we look bad and we're gonna lose some hegemonic space, right? So I'm, again, it's maybe it's because of where I spent the last three years, but when these narratives pop up, it's, I, I worry, is it just the same, you know, are we, are we just flexing that muscle that we already have? Yeah, it sounds, the script sounds very familiar. Um, and, and so let me yeah. ask you about a related question in terms of how the history that you wrote about relates to our current political climate, which is the question of the domestic political debate surrounding these policies that you're documenting in this book and the extent to which there was disagreement or dissent or debate in mainstream power centers, particularly among the two major political parties. I remember, you know, probably the first, 
um, time I really paid close attention, delving into the Cold War beyond the propagandistic scripts we were fed as children about the Soviet Union and the United States, was kind of from a civil liberty, libertarian perspective, from looking at the McCarthyite, the McCarthyite um, era and what McCarthyism was. And, and, and it was largely wielded by the far right against American liberals and the Democratic Party. Obviously, there were communists in the United States that it was aimed at too, but it, um, yeah. from the beginning, but creeped over time into anything vaguely liberal and anything connected to the Democratic Party. And it kind of even culminated with people on the far right claiming that Ronald Reagan, who they worked to put into power, was like a useful idiot because he was negotiating arms control deals with Mikhail Gorbachev. So it just kind of swept into it. And I, so I always assumed that, well, Democrats must have been the opponents of the Cold War. Otherwise, why would they be accused of being friendly? The yeah. communists, and you look a little deep, deeper and you see the Vietnam War was more or less started by Kennedy and escalated severely by Johnson and Truman was kind of the pioneer of um, a lot of the, the Cold War repression. Um, but let me ask you about Kennedy specifically, because I found this really nuanced portrait that you drew of him in the book really fascinating. And I was, I'm wondering how it kind of relates to the role that each political party played. So on the one hand, you talk about how Kennedy was making an effort to visit non-allied countries or the developing world and understanding um, the the specific and valid grievances that were leading them to not want to be captive to or subject to Washington um, and kind of sometimes even denouncing imperialism as this evil repression against the desire of people to be free in the world. But then on the other hand, he was a hardcore anti-communist. You have this one passage that said, but Jack Kennedy certainly had no time for the Reds during his first campaign. He said, quote, the time has come when we must speak plainly on the greatest you face in the world today. The issue is Soviet Russia. He saw labor unions, unions as self-serving and infiltrated by communists and let their members know it in congressional hearings. And in 1954, when a special Senate committee recommended that Joseph McCarthy be condemned for breaking Senate rules, John F. Kennedy was the only Democrat not to vote against him. So how would you characterize the role that the two parties played in terms of these Cold War abuses and, uh, and, and atrocities? Do you see there being just minor differences now and then in the context of broad bipartisan consensus, or were there real differences that they debated and that, that defined which, what the party's approaches were? Uh, there were minor differences, uh, quite minor. And I think that the things that, like I said, like we really know about the Nixon stuff because he was kind of disgraced and there was huge investigations at everything that happened under him. But I think in terms of foreign policy, in terms of the way that we interact with Latin America and Asia, the things that happened under JFK and Johnson were as bad. Um, and JFK is really interesting, right? And I think it kind of, I mean, for me, it was resonant because I'm, you know, a millennial or whatever that means, you know, if that's still something we say, but it was really resonant with the Obama story, right? Because JFK in the 50s, was, you know, he was a savvy politician. He um, he knew that blaming the other guy for being soft on communism always worked, and it did, and so both sides did it. Um, but he was also well-traveled, and he met all these third world leaders, and he spoke out against French um, uh, activities in Algeria. He kind of made these statements that were Sukarno back in Indonesia heard about. Sukarno was very excited about John F. Kennedy because John F. Kennedy had said in terms more sort of courageous than anybody else in the US government at the time, well, the people of the third world, like they should have their right to pick what they want. I mean, it's, it's, it's not about us, right? However, he starts office and the, the CIA already exists. The pay of pigs is already underway. So when you become president of the United States, you don't get to like recreate your government. You don't show up with like a, you know, government creation pack, right? You inherit active um, operations and I think the Bay of Pigs blew up in his face right away. And not only did he realize he has to deal with the CIA and whatever it is they're doing everywhere. I mean, Patrice Lumumba died right as he was preparing to take office. And that was the CIA, you know, the CIA had planned the assassination. They didn't get the poison to the right guy, but it ended up being killed by one of our allies. And he realized not only do I have to deal with whatever all this stuff is, now everyone else is gonna do what I was doing, which is to accuse me of being soft on communism. And you see a pretty radical flip after, after Bay of Pigs. And I mean, that might be sort of a, a narrative simplification that I do in the book, but I think that you get into the US government and you're running the presidency of the United States and you realize what it's really for. Like, you know, there's 
you know, this is, you know, there's 10 buttons in this machine and I can only press the 10 that are here. And if I don't, people are going to yell at me. So eventually I'm going to press those 10 buttons and they might be coups and missiles and, and invasions. And then in, you know, in Latin America, he really flipped too. I mean, you can listen to the recording of him telling the ambassador to Brazil to prepare the, the, the grounds for a coup, right? Um, he sent a special military att attache to Brazil. Um, and, you know, very few people know this still in Brazil, but the first dictator of Brazil was the former roommate of that military attache. They had lived together in Italy back in the 1940s. So to answer your question about bipartisanship, I think, I mean, if you were to ask somebody in Indonesia or Brazil that suffered through this, and that lived through sort of U.S. foreign policy from 1945 to 1990, it feels the same. It feel, uh, in other countries, I think it feels, feels largely the same. I mean, Jimmy Carter was a very short and rare exception, but uh, still, th horrible things happened under. You know, Jimmy Carter tried to enforce some human rights uh, um, rules on Central American dictators, and it just didn't work. And then it was just fine. And then, but also, Jimmy Carter allowed for some horrible things to happen in East Timor. He ended up helping China or telling China that they could invade Vietnam to punish them for overthrowing Pol Pot. I mean, there's no. There's not a there's not a gap in this kind of you know litany of of horrible interventions. So just as, as my last question, I had a lot of other passages I wanted to ask you about, but we're kind of running out of time, and 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 I I so I want to encourage people to read the book in part because it is just so informative. The book is incredibly incredible in that it's stripped of adjectives, like there's no time when you explicitly express emotional indignation it's just the 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 facts of the actions by the u.s government and the ca are so horrific that just describing them to describe them is sufficient to convey how awful they were they are and yet you, it, it is so dark and it is so uh grim to f confront the reality of what your country did not occasionally and sp sporadically but systemically you know as a as a generalized right. approach and you and i were joking a little bit as we were planning the interview about, you know, how you chose to release the book, or I guess the book was released, date was set well in advance of the pandemic. And as it turns out, you're releasing in the middle of the pandemic where people are surrounded by stories about death and suffering and their own lives have been upended. Um, and, and, you know, the instinct isn't necessarily to say, let me delve into some more suffering and violence and, and murder. And yet there's really important reasons to do so and a lot of value in doing so, so rather than have me explain that, although I probably will in the segment that precedes this discussion, let me give you the opportunity to answer why is it important for Americans to take the time to um, inform themselves and educate themselves about the reality of what their government did 50 years ago and 70 years ago? Is it just because there's like a moral responsibility to know the history, the true history of your country as opposed to the mythology? Or is there something about these episodes that help us inform our understanding of our own government in the world today? I think it's not just moral responsibility. I think that if it were just accounting for the bad stuff we did, it would be less urgent than I think it is. I think, and this is, I think that's, we, we, this goes back to the sort of narrative that a lot of people receive about the Cold War. Like, yeah, well, we made, um, we made alliances with some bad guys and they did some bad things. Those bad things were not incidental to the world order that we inhabit. They were constitutive of the world order that we inhabit. And now that we're at a moment when there's a sort of uh, path, in, you know, several paths uh, that we could take, there's a sort of fork in the road, there's a re-examination of US hegemony, a re-examination of the globalized system that we live in now. Um, I think to actually understand what it is, we have to understand the ways in which it was constructed. and. Um, and, and I mean, then there's the more concrete um, reality of, you know, we're both in Brazil. Obviously, Bolsonaro exists because of this history, and in Indonesia, people are suffering because of, the, because of this history. It not only constructed, you know, was a, a big part of the infrastructure for the globalized world that everyone inhabits, and which is now going to have to change somehow. We have no idea how, but it's not going to be exactly the same. It also has really direct effects on you know, dozens, if not a hundred countries in the third world. And to understand what is existing now, I think is, uh, is essential to decide how to move out of this 
global crisis moment. Yeah, it's fascinating how history ends up getting understood. Um, and it's why I emphasized earlier that, you know, if you study, you know, 200 uh, BC, it seems really distant. But even like thinking about what the government of your own country did in 1963 can seem really distant as well. And the reality is, it's actually extremely recent in the sense that maybe what happened in, you know, ancient Greece um, doesn't directly shape the world we're living in. It does intellectually, but not necessarily geostrategically, whereas the events that you're writing about as part of the Cold War have a direct effect on the kind of country we are, as you said earlier, the privileges that we have. Um, and if we want to keep those privileges, I think it's important not to delude ourselves into thinking that we have them because we're better, but we have them because of all of this violence and repression that brought that power and that wealth to the United States. And, and that's what we're actually enjoying. So um, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk to me. And I really appreciate as well you're writing this book because um, I do think, especially for people who started paying attention to U.S. politics in the last few years out of fear of Donald Trump, or even more recently because they were inspired by Obama or whatever, um, this all does seem like the, re the distant past because the Cold War is over, when in reality I think it's extremely relevant to how we should be thinking about the choices that we want to make now about the new enemies that we're being presented. So thanks very much, Vincent, for writing such a great book. Well, thank you so much. All right, talk soon.